Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Candidates Education Forum. My name is Randell McShepard, and I am the co-chair co of the Public Engagement Committee of the County Transition Process. I also sit on the Executive Committee of the County Transition Process, and I work for RPM International Incorporated as Vice President of Public Affairs. Um, now, I'm sure many of you are wondering about the crutches. Uh, Mr. McCafferty was just yelling something about that. Uh, for the sake of time, all I can say is that there were two thugs and an 80-year-old woman in an alley, and you, you don't want all the details, so I, I'll pass on that. But I, I want you to know that um, I did think about these crutches, and in doing so, I realized that being on crutches is very similar to being a candidate. Now, now you might ask, uh, you know, how, how can that be? First of all, there's a lot of heavy lifting involved. It's nice when someone can open doors for you. You need a lot of help. And finally, you do whatever you can to not stumble and fall, right? So wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, yes, thank you. So we're, we're kindred spirits today. But um, if we could uh, get to the matter at hand, um, the, this session was actually uh, planned uh, by the hardworking members of uh, the county tag and uh, the transition uh, team to uh, really accomplish a few things. Number one, we want to ensure that the candidates have a base understanding of county operations, especially those impacted by the charter. Number two, we want to provide a general update on the transition work group activity, and I can assure you there has been much great work that has taken place over the last several months. And thirdly, we want to give you an opportunity to hear actual experiences from comparative counties. We have guests, I'm sure that you've seen already in the agenda, joining us uh, to tell us their stories. In addition to what you will learn from the presentations, please also be reminded that there is plenty of information about the current operations, uh, both on the county's main webpage and the transition work group uh, progress is also updated regularly on the uh, transition website. So I would encourage you to visit those consistently if you haven't. Um, that information on the transition website includes everything from meeting summaries to audio files to visual recordings where you can actually see um, forms that have taken place and uh, make your own notes. Um, before uh, getting into some of the formal remarks, I wanted to briefly review a few housekeeping uh, items as well as ground rules for today that will help to outline our, our flow of work. Uh, number one, um, as you can see from the rear of the room, the entire session is open to the public and the media and is being recorded and it will be posted on our www.charter.cuyahogacounty.us website. Uh, also, all materials shared today, including the PowerPoints, will be available online. So feel free to go back and get any of the information today that you will see. Uh, there is an abundance of information that is being presented and all candidates will have the opportunity to ask questions at the completion of the presentations in the guest forum. So we're asking you to hold your questions until after all of the presentations take place. Um, the good news is that uh, all of the key presenters will be around. Um, I can assure you they're a wealth of information. They're not going to vote for the door. They plan on staying around and answering questions and uh, dialoguing with each of you. And. Um, because of the uh, packed agenda and the focus of today's session, there will not be time for questions and comments from the, the general public. Um, as co-chair of the Public Engagement Committee, let me say, we always love to see the public at any of these meetings, and we love you, but today's program is designated for the candidates, and we do want to give them as much time as we can to arm them with as much information as they will need uh, to move forward with their respective campaigns. Uh, candidates, uh, along those lines, I will ask that you keep in mind that this is an educational event and not a campaign event. So <laughs> um, please uh, state your questions and uh, not necessarily out outline your platform uh, for the sake of time again. Our, uh, we're also excited to report that the county agencies have set up tables in the lobby and representatives are prepared to respond to any specific questions that you may have about any of those uh, agencies throughout the ent entire or entirety of this session. So um, we hope that you will visit those tables, gather information, ask questions, again, to help you better understand county government. Uh, the restrooms are in the lobby area, I do believe to the right, uh, when you exit. 
and uh, refreshments are located uh, in the rear of the meeting area. I think um, I can see the coffee machines from here, so help yourselves. Um, along those lines, I might also add that we're only going to take one short break, so feel free to take restroom breaks or you know, move about as necessary, grab a cup of coffee, because there won't really be a lot of uh, structured break time. Um, finally, I will ask that you take the time before you leave to complete the exit surveys. Uh, one of the things that we've done with the Public Engagement Committee um, at the uh, direction of Dr. Jeff Brutney from Cleveland State University, who's uh, very active on our committee, is trying to track and evaluate the effectiveness of these kinds of activities. We want to better understand if we're serving the purpose that we think we are, um, and uh, we're, we're gathering and, and uh, preparing that information for a final report that we will do uh, when the process is all over. Um, one last thing before I uh, introduce our, our host, and that is, um, you should know that this isn't the only session of its kind that will take place. Our plan is to have another event after the primary and to have several orientations after the general election for those that uh, are finalists. So um, we really are committed to ensure that we do all that we can to give as much information uh, to all of you so that as you take uh, on the new uh, government structure that you will be as prepared as we all know you need to be. So uh, with that, I will uh, like to introduce Claire Rosacco, who um, I've known for a number of years. Um, I can tell you she's a leader in our community, and uh, Tri-C is certainly lucky to have her. She is Vice President of Government Relations and Community Outreach, and she would like to offer a welcome on behalf of Cuyahoga Community College. So Claire. Good morning, everybody. And we are so excited to host you today because the work that you're doing is so important to the county and to Northeast Ohio. Uh, you are at Corporate College East. We also have a Corporate College West, and this is our business and professional development arm of our institution. We do a lot of uh, personal development training, and we do an awful lot of corporate and business training at our facilities, both at here and on the West Side. Uh, just a minute to give you maybe an overview of Cuyahoga Community College, which I'm sure many of you have heard about and know about, but some things you may not realize. We were the first community college in the state of Ohio, uh, started in 1963. We had the largest opening of any community college in the country downtown at the Brownell Building, and there's still photos with 3,000 people lined up the day that the college opened circling the building. It was phenomenal. I don't think there's been as big an opening um, of any new college like that uh, since we started. It was very unique. Uh, the college has uh, approximately 55,000 students annually. We had in the fall 30,000 credit students that joined us. That was our largest fall semester in the history of the institution. And we were pretty excited that we could handle all of that capacity at our three campuses. Um, again, we're thrilled to have you. We also do an awful lot of workforce and economic development training. We call that our WED group. So we do a lot of non-credit uh, training as well. We have information on the college in the lobby area, so I hope you get a chance to take that as you are here today and take a look at it. At it. If you can almost think of a course um, that you'd like to take, I'd be surprised if we didn't have it at one of our facilities. Um, we are usually in the top 10 community colleges in the country in training for allied health professionals. We have over 8,000 students that have declared health careers their major. And as you can imagine in Northeast Ohio, why that's so critical to us, because our largest employers are the healthcare community right now. So I just want you to know we're very much in sync with that and um, thrilled to have you here. We hope to have you back uh, after the um, primary. And again, welcome and use the facility that really is yours too. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Claire. We really appreciate you opening up your home to us. We promise to leave it better than we found it. Um, I think we can, uh, we're right on schedule and we'll jump right into our first uh, presentation. I'd like to introduce Matt Rubino, who is the Interim Director of the Office of uh, Budget and Management. And just to give you a little bit of information about Matt, he is the Interim Director that has been with OBM since June of 2000, when he began work as a budget analyst in government 
um, in general government and was promoted to the position of senior analyst for financial reporting and systems in 2003. Prior to coming to Cuyahoga County, he worked for the City of Cleveland Department of Finance as a project coordinator, did great work there. Uh, he's a lifelong Cleveland resident. He's a graduate of the University of Akron and uh, received his master's degree in public administration uh, from there as well. So please welcome uh, Matt Rubino. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'll be giving a presentation on a few things, give you some idea of the county budget this year. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, where we are right now based on some of the recent economic events and where we're projecting to be by the end of the year. And then we'll just take a look ahead into 2011, um, how we anticipate the budget development process to go. And, um, give you some, some reality, some of the things we'll be dealing with when we develop next year's budget. But I hope you find the information um, understandable, accessible, and have, have some questions afterwards. And it looks like the presentation will be in stereo. So let's look at the uh, 2010 budget. It's just a snapshot of county finances. Budget's balanced, remaining at current service levels. Uh, we maintain our, our credit um, as determined by the credit rating agencies. We have AA1, AA+, plus, second highest county in Ohio, fifth largest employer in the county. I've been a major force for economic development. Um, within that budget, we've continued to um, provide agencies um, budget incentives for coming under budget at the end of the year and continue to pro provide quality service at a low effective millage rate, and I'll demonstrate that. This is the effective voted and unvoted millage. You can see we are kind of average, not uh, the highest compared to our peer counties in Ohio. And again, those don't include Metro Parks, Library, and the Port Authority. Now, how do we compare uh, with our peers in terms of per capita budget? We are second lowest per capita uh, based on the two 2010 approved budgets of the individual counties. So the budget guidelines, the budget in itself is a plan, and that plan reflects our mission, our objectives. And these, we publish these each year in our, our budget plan that's available on our website. And you can see, before we even talk about numbers, we reflect on and, and, and keep in mind of what our, our mission is. And, and that's what these are, encourage opportunity and strengthen our economy, be ex excellent stewards of county assets, improve operations, promote innovation. Uh, they're all important. Uh, citizens will be healthy. Children will be well cared for and safe. So it gives you a broad understanding of what the county uh, feels is its mission, its core mission. And that's how we, we wrap the budget around these objectives. Let's talk about the, the budget itself. When we go to develop uh, the 20, 2010 budget, come up with a set of parameters or rules that we plug in and develop a, a set of, of, of budget numbers. So just to give you an idea of what we did for 2010, we, we used the prior year as kind of a starting point. So we took a snapshot of 2009 at mid-year and used that as a building block. We had an early retirement incentive program. We carried those savings into the 2010 budget. It's approximately 39 million countywide. So those numbers are reflected in that budget, those savings. Counties with uh, self-supporting revenues are limited to, those, to that source of revenue. And there's no cost of living uh, increases um, unless there was one approved in a bargaining agreement, and there's very few of those this year. And we do have savings from five furlough days in this uh, particular budget, the first half of uh, this year. Additional parameters, 5% increase in hospitalization, 2% uh, inflationary increase. We did not entertain additional funding. And uh, we also had the budget, in uh, budget incentive plan that I mentioned earlier. So here we have a snapshot of the approved 2010 budget. It's just, we're giving it to you in very uh, broad terms. We have four columns in this particular view. We have general fund operating, which is the county's core pool of resources, the levy dollars. Third column is just, a, we like to total and, and see what is our total general fund operating and levy dollars available. Those represent the, the general funding of the county. And that's how you get that total general fund column. And then the last column, all funds, all county operating funds consolidated. And it gives you a pretty good idea 
of where we're at for this particular budget. A few, few things to note, the operating surplus is what we anticipate to bring in in revenue versus what we anticipate to expend. Our goal when we develop a budget is to be in balance when that budget is approved. I know the all funds shows a slight deficit, but there's some more technical reasons why that shows up. But in essence, the balanced budget was approved. The next few pie charts are going to demonstrate the composition of those sources and uses of funds. So we're going to take these particular columns of numbers and just look at them in pie chart format, give you an idea of what the budget's composed of. So all funds, firstly, this is where the money comes from, the revenue. And you can see um, when we look at an all funds basis, intergovernmental is the biggest slice of that pie. The dollars that flow down from the state and federal government in particular that go to a lot of programs, including health and human services, make up the biggest piece. Property tax, that would include all those voted levies. The two human service levies, the Board of De Developmental Disabilities are also in there, and then the dollars that come through our general property tax. Sales tax, another significant one. I'll come back to sales tax. It's, it doesn't look as significant when you view it as um, an all-funds basis. We'll come back to that. All right, so how are we spe expending those dollars in this current budget plan? You can see social services, uh, 45%. It's a big piece of that all-funds budget, very significant. And some of the others, judicial, would be the courts, sheriff, the other uh, justice services the county provides. And these are not inclusive of capital projects and grants. Those are multi-year budgets that flow year to year, multiple years. The operating budget is on an annual basis, so these exclude those expenditures. Let's talk about general fund. That'd be this, the third column in that, that previous snapshot. General fund and levy combined. You can see property tax is more significant as is sales tax, nearly a third of those dollars. This pie chart excludes the additional sales tax we're levying right now for the medical mark project, which is a quarter percent. Let's break down and take this pie chart and just filter out general fund operating only, which represents the core pool of resources the county has to fund a lot of these programs that um, you may be familiar with. Sales tax, you can see it's over uh, half of that funding source. This chart includes the MedMart, but even without MedMart, it's almost 50%. Key takeaway, I think, is a very significant stream of revenue is also very sensitive to economic conditions. And we'll see later on uh, how that impacts our budget plan. Back to general fund combined with levies. How are we expending both general fund operating and levy dollars? Again, just the composition judicial, which includes courts, sheriff, the other justice services in the county, and social services take up um, majority of those dollars. So we've continued to reduce the budget. What I'm doing is, this is fixed in time. This is the 2010 budget. If we look at general fund operating over the past few years, what, is, what has happened to how we spend these dollars? What's, what's the rate? You can see from 08 to 09, realized almost over a 10% reduction in that general fund operating budget. We had to react and develop a plan based on the conditions, the economic conditions. Less revenue, identify, we have to identify cuts, bring the budget in line with what our resources are. And that's what that 10% reflects from 08 to 09. And then again, another over 3% uh, reduction from 9 to 10. A lot of that is ref reflecting the early retirement program and the savings we carried into the 2010 budget plan. We also had the uh, five-day furlough. And uh, the early retirement, again, is in there in the cuts we've carried through into 2010 from 09. I'm just going to go through these, put a little color to some of the choices and decisions we've had to make uh, the past year and a half. It's about looking at what programs are, are being funded by the county budget. We know we need to make reductions. This is just an example of specific program areas that we've had to identify for cuts or find reductions to make, to make those, th those uh, targets line up with our resources. Continuation of a hiring freeze. Uh, the ERIP was done as a cost savings or cost avoidance tool. And again, we've carried over 39 million on an all funds basis into, into the current budget with that savings. 
a lot of programs that impact children and, and social services ended up in here. You, you look at what's mandatory, what's discretionary. Even though the discretionary may be very important or crucial, it's, it requires some decision making on where we can make cuts, and that's what this list reflects. And there's other reductions or savings. You have energy efficiency measures, uh, finding ways to improve service delivery, cuts to a particular subsidy, in this case, Adams Board. I want to break down and look at levy expenditures. So we had total general fund reflecting general fund operating and levy. Uh, this is a good example of levy dollars we've expended the past two years. You can see if we look at uh, 2010, over $232 million of levy dollars being plugged into social services and health and safety uh, throughout the county. Those dollars are generated by the two voted levies, one of which was just renewed in May. Uh, they serve as a local match to pull down state and federal dollars. So without that 232 plus dollars, we're not able to, le to leverage federal and state dollars without it. And that's very key, that's the reason why getting that levy renewed this year was, was so important to these programs. Something to keep in mind, this next state budget cycle, which begins in earnest early next year, um, there could be impacts if there are reductions at the state level in terms of what funding they provide the county uh, for health and human services that will impact our local, our local budgets and could require increased local match from levies. And again, the levy dollars are restricted to the programs we've identified as health and human services and health and safety. Go back up to a higher level, we look at staffing. You can see the trend has been downward. Staffing numbers are represented in FTEs. It's a budget term you may be familiar with, full-time equivalent. This is not a person count. It's a full-time equivalent count, a budgetary measure of staffing. And you can see we've had downward trend over the past three to four years. The biggest drop from 08 to 09 is showing the drop in employees from the early retirement uh, incentive program that was instituted starting last year. It had approximately 900 employees take this buyout we're able to generate savings or avoid costs and carry those into future years. And that's what you're seeing, the, um, the drop down to um, just over 8,000 FTEs in 2010 shows the, the full impact of that. Now one other note with this chart, you'll notice from 10 to 11 you see a bounce up of almost 200. It's actually reflecting, we had a furlough this year of five days, so you're seeing lower FTE counts because they're based on hours worked. Right now in 2011, we're not reflecting any kind of furlough or staff reduction. So what you have is FTEs bouncing back up to their natural level, so to speak. So it's not additional hiring. Just a key point I wanted to make. All right, where are we today? Develop a budget plan, gets approved in December, and that's our operating plan for the year. In the budget office, each quarter, we're taking, making an assessment of where we stand based on Recent activity, revenue expenditures, other information we've got from our agencies and programs. We like to check how are we operating against that, that budget plan. And that's where we're going to look at the next few slides. Let's just talk about recent economic events. You're probably familiar with a lot of these. It's just a snapshot of our, our misery. But again, the Great Recession, these things you read about, you're familiar with, they have a tangible impact on the county's budget. And that's why I just wanted to show these is not to depress anybody, but just to give you an idea of where we've been, how we've had to adapt to a vastly different landscape than three or four years ago. We're familiar with the, the start with the government rescue, the financial system, uh, the stimulus act, which county has benefited from, from additional grant dollars, bonding provisions that help us uh, realize savings, housing market woes started well before the recession in Cuyahoga County, You're probably familiar. High levels of unemployment, not just unemployment, but the, the, the rate of unemployment claims has continued to remain high. It's slowed down, but it's still at a level as to which we're nowhere near job creation in the county, in Ohio, uh, for that matter. Again, some other things, uh, GDP has been low. Going down to the local level, sales tax is a reflection of economic activity, um, has a lot of impact for us. And you can see last year we had over 10% drop. We've never seen that before. Went back and looked at the last two or three recessionary periods, the most you would see in, in cash basis, nominal dollars, would be two or 3%. You can see that the depth of this downturn is reflected in that rate. It's a barometer of economic activity, over 10% drop. 
And if you remember that pie chart, we're approaching that's almost 50% of the general fund operating budget. So you can, you can imagine uh, how that has to make us stop and make changes to adapt to that, that low level. Uh, there's been some signs of recovery in, in, in Northeast Ohio and the state, but again, with, there's other things kind of counteracting that that make us take pause. LeBron James leaves for Miami. Now, I, I, the metaphysical strife aside on LeBron leaving, I think it's illustrative of uh, the need to have a diverse economic base. Sports is great, um, having casinos, convention centers, all these things add up, but it, it just shows you how um, one event can have an impact. I know there's been some media reports of certain dollar amounts that could impact the, the economy. We'll see if those things come to pass, but just taking the county specifically, we realize revenue from emissions tax to the arena that helped pay the, the bonds on, on that arena that was constructed some years ago. Just a 10% drop in attendance over the year could cost us three or $400,000 a year um, if those, those revenues decline, which they very well made. That's, that's why I included that, just to illustrate how those things impact us. I don't expect you to <laughs> interpret this, but we have to look at external information when we're going along throughout the year and making assessments of the, of the budget in and, and this year and for next year. We're always looking externally at economic indicators. These are some national indicators. We get local information and uh, help us make some judgments. We, we have information throughout the year we can use to make an assessment. Uh, we, we can read information on what's going on in the economy. There's a variety of resources. You can take all this and temper your assessment of the current state of the budget, but you still have to use judgment. So you look at these numbers and you can, all right, understand why something is what it is in terms of a, of a measure, but how do you temper that and how do you then use judgment to make a determination where we'll end this year and develop a budget within resources next year? And that's why I provided this. It's just a dashboard way of looking at economic in indicators, and some look good. Inflation's low, which to some extent is good, but not for an extended period of time. You can see just looking at that number right there, mortgage delinquencies, we still have not recovered. We're not, not even near recovering from the collapse of the housing market, and that's a national number. So what are the impacts on county's revenue? Realize this downturn. This chart just reflects, in inflation-adjusted terms, where we've been since 2001. Remember, there was a recessionary period in 2001. This region never fully recovered from, from that downturn. Uh, we did pick up, but you can see when you factor inflation in, key thing is that our purchasing power is greatly diminished by uh, almost a quarter. And these numbers are they exclude the MedMart sales tax collection. So we're just showing our ongoing revenue stream. All right, so where are we right now? This is as of first quarter, made an updated assessment of our operating plan. If you remember this format, we have the four column snapshot. Key thing we want to look at is the next to last line where it says surplus deficit. You can see the general fund operating right now, we're just in balance, levy funds, we have a deficit that will have to be addressed in the current year and going forward. So we are spending slightly more than we're taking in on the levy side. We roll those up. Deficit's about the same. All funds basis, we have a surplus. Not as meaningful in terms of general fund. The, the general fund operating provides you the key indicator of the county's uh, financial condition. So keep that in mind when you see these tables or see other ancillary budget reports. General fund is key barometer for us. All right, so what about the uh, next two years, this year and the next two years? If you look across the middle, there's our 3.1 deficit for this year. What's concerning to us is the structural imbalance we're looking at right now for next year. Based on all things we know about the county budget, revenue trends, expenditure trends, when you look at general fund and levy combined, we're looking at an almost $20 million deficit um, next year. That will have to be addressed in the budget development process that begins in August. The main reason we have this imbalance is because revenue has not recovered from the 2007-2008 levels. They're, we are out of sync. Even though we made those cuts 10%, 3% in the past two years, realized savings, with all that taken into consideration, 
without local economics improving and then translating into more dollars into the general fund, we, are, we have a structural imbalance. Uh, the state does also, I'll address that in a later slide, but you can see that is going to have to be a concern of the budget development process that begins this year. Some history on deficits. There, there's, you can see that blue line is kind of the center point. Last five years, out of the last uh, five years, we've had three deficits, meaning at the end of the year, when all is said and done, brought in slightly less in revenue than what we expended. Um, not catastrophic. Each year in itself is not catastrophic. But persistent deficits or persistent structural imbalance, especially when that level increases, can be corrosive in nature to, to, to county finances. So we have to address that. And we do address it each year. If, we're, if we are um, estimating some kind of imbalance, becomes a center point of budget development, and it will be this year. So why, why is ending cash balance so important? Why do we have to make sure we're not spending more than we bring in? Why can we not whittle down our cash balance, just spend through it? And these are some key concerns. Again, what, those, those revenue sources are highly dependent on economic conditions. So we need that, that cash cushion there to protect against this downturn we've seen. Uh, the state and federal budgets, we know there have been impacts at those levels too that will um, have an impact on our revenue. Reserve is also important for any kind of one-time uh, cash needs, legal settlements, unexpected catastrophes. That's really a, a priority uh, for cash, cash reserve. Again, reimbursing expenses in advance. Again, also in terms of the county's credit, the county's ability to go to the financial markets and borrow long-term for vital capital improvements to buildings and infrastructure in order to get rates that are a low and save the taxpayer dollars. We need to maintain those ratings and cash balance. It's a reflection of financial management and it uh, definitely has an impact on your ability to get low rates when you borrow. And that, that last point just shows you just a one hundredth of a percent over, um, that should be 20 year bond issue. It's $35,000 a year so you can see the tangible impact of, of that. All right, so 2011 and beyond. Our top concerns. Again, those deficits I mentioned, that structural imbalance, we're going to have to be identifying ways to address that. Keeping in mind we have core values and objectives we want to adhere to. This is our financial reality that also has to be addressed. Sales tax growth, will it happen? Sales tax has been up and down. We're not seeing a trend that exhibits real growth. We've seen some inflationary growth and some growth from some changes at the state in terms of broadening the sales tax base, but nothing that makes me walk away and say, yes, I see a sustainable uh, indication of growth in sales tax numbers. Fiscal austerity at the federal level, if you've been reading or watching reports on the, the federal level, the so-called extenders bill has provisions that would help state governments. State government and federal government can serve as a backstop for local governments. Um, those austerity measures can have an impact just looking at the um, the FMAP, which is the, the additional Medicaid dollars to states, if those are not renewed. I've seen estimates of job losses in the hundreds of thousands of numbers at the state and local level when all is said and done, so just something to keep in, measure, uh, in mind. State budget, I'm using the number $7 billion shortfall based on a report I've read. That's the high end of the range this report provided, and I'll give you the name of the report at the end. State's going to have to make cuts. County is an administrative extension of the state. So dollars they pass down to the local level will most likely suffer when the state addresses their very sizable imbalance. Impacts of health care reform, potential reforms of PRS we'll have to keep in mind. Uh, transition to charter government, there are mandates and structural changes that we will have to address in our spending plan. Again, all these changes happen amongst shared resources. State budget, let's just drill into that a few points on the state budget. Cuts to human service programs will strain the local match. We have less local match um, available. We could end up spending down reserve and levy funds, so that's of key importance. We'll be watching the state process going into next year. A local government fund is a pool of resources the state allocates down to the local level to counties, cities, school districts. Uh, there's a lot of talk of reducing that, that pool of resources. Just as reference, we received about $31 million this year, or we will receive that much. Just, you can see it, it 
10% cut is a $3 million hit to the general fund, which will mean additional um, adaptation of that spending plan based on any, any hits to general or local government fund. Additional cuts will impact all levels of government. The state plays a large role in funding local government. Um, inability to find replacement revenue for phase out of tangible personal property. It, just the key thing is the state phased out personal property, provided a substitute revenue, but that substitute will phase out and we could stand to lose $16 million countywide once that's phased out, so something we keep in mind. And if, just to show you that it is real, going out at the state, they have formed a commission to begin looking at the, the budget uh, process for next year. We'll see what kind of recommendations or plan of action they provide. All right, what about good news? Yes, there is good news. County Administrator asked for a rainbow the last time I gave this presentation, so that's why that's, that's in there. Uh, the levy was renewed in, in May, which is a good thing. We worked hard, and that, that does help preserve um, levy dollars. Some of the major local projects that can make a difference, uh, the Med Martin Convention Center, eventually we have downtown casino. There's been some major highway construction plans slated, and the Flats East Bank is, is moving ahead. All those things will have a, a medium or long-term beneficial impact to the county. And again, it should translate into additional dollars coming in in terms of sales tax, property tax. It's not going to happen next year. That's going to take several years for these things to come online and start making a real difference and changing the, the landscape that we see right now. So those are important points to keep in mind. Uh, continued use of our dollars, possible end of recession in Cuyahoga County, Things are looking okay. The, the key term that seems to be uh, proliferating the airwaves is things are getting worse at a slower pace. You can't build much of a economic growth on that premise, but that's what we have right now. We, we have weathered the worst of the recession so far, uh, as long as things don't downturn again. Uh, we're looking at the potential release of our 07 and 08 financial audits, uh, possibly by the end of the week, and that has a lot of uh, uh, implications. It's going to make it easier for us to issue bonds and. Um, maintain federal grant dollars. Missing some points. Okay, 2011 budget objectives. Stabilizing the general fund and levy fund. Balancing revenues and expenditures. Again, sustaining those critical services. Looking for creative solutions for service delivery, which we're always evaluating how programs are implemented, what services we offer. Defining these priorities based on strategic planning, there's an onus on agencies to have a strategic plan, to have objectives and a mission, and, and work towards that, that plan. The numbers kind of wrap around that plan. That's another key thing. And then again, collaborating internally and externally. Where will we look for savings? Well, we've, we've been making um, budget cuts over the past two years. These are three main areas. Looking at the big picture, how do we deploy and provide services? Programmatic focus, having agencies look at what services they offer, can they make cuts to discretionary things. And then again, using the changes in the new charter to, to, to leverage savings or leverage reductions over the, I think over the next two to three years you see there are potential. Maybe not right away, I think there's going to be a learning process, but there is potential there. Some of the, the basic uh, budget impacts on the transition, I won't go through all these, but you're probably familiar. We will develop a, an annual budget plan for 2011. We'll, we will include some of the major basic structural changes. A lot of the newer changes will come from recommendations, and the budget can and will be revised the first quarter of next year to uh, take on those changes. So real quick, budget process, what, what's next? The budget office is working on a mid-year evaluation. We're going to use that as a springboard, jump into the waters of 2011, and work on budget development, addressing all these concerns. Um, we'll probably have administrative hearing process internally, public hearings. There'll be a final recommendation and budget approval this year in fourth quarter. And again, the budget we approve for next year can be revised in first quarter to account for additional recommendations from this charter transition process. Additional budget information on our website, some suggested reading, our budget plan, our annual information statement. It's more of a financial report. We have quarterly reports. Quarter two is due, due out in August. Uh, the report I mentioned earlier was put out by the Center for Community Solutions. It's called Thinking the Unthinkable, Finding Common Ground for Ohio's Fiscal Crisis. They do a good job of having the reader get their arms around the state's problem structurally, identifying it and putting a number to it, and then just putting out a pragmatic approach of how the state could and would have to balance their budget. And from that, you can kind of get an idea of what are the implications for county government.
and for local government in general. And that's why I include that link. It's at their website if you want to read it. It's a very good report. And that's all I have. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Testing. Yeah. I'm uh, pulling on Matt's. I'm pulling on Matt's coat uh, to let him know that we uh, need to push on. And uh, it's probably not fair to ask uh, someone uh, in charge of a county budget to, you know, tell the full story in 20 minutes. But we did want to give you enough of a, an overview so that you can um, visit with him perhaps after this session and continue to ask questions. Um, I also wanted to uh, state that I saw a couple of you in the room starting to kind of raise your hands. We have to hold all questions to the end. And uh, please, uh, if you would mind putting all cell phones on silence mode. Uh, very quickly, we're going to move right into our next uh, presenter, uh, Mr. Jim McCafferty, who is the Cuyahoga County Administrator. He was appointed Administrator in July of 2008. He is the Chief Operating Officer of Ohio's largest county, managing an annual budget of about $1.5 billion, and as you saw from the slide, about 8,000 employees. Uh, he's served for 28 years in a number of capacities with Cuyahoga County, so uh, certainly a wealth of information. And I'll just uh, close by saying that he holds a Master's of uh, so Social Science Administration from uh, Mandel and received a Bachelor of Science from Xavier. So with that, take it away. Thank you, Randy. Good morning. Thank you for coming out. Um, what I'm going to give you is really a 50,000 foot uh, view of government and the functions that we do. However, in your briefing books, there's a far more in-depth analysis of what we're going to talk about. And we are welcome and here for the next six, five to six months for any of you to come in and spend time with us at any time to get more. The other thing I would point out is that out in the lobby, the representatives from all the county agencies under the Board of Commissioners, as well as most of the elected officials, and that staff is here to answer questions as well. The, there's a chart behind me that is not an organizational chart. What we did was took all the functions of county government today and tried to chart them how they are addressed by the charter and to chart those that are not addressed by the charter as well. And I believe this chart is actually in your briefing book as well, if you can't see it. So I won't be referring directly to it, but that's what the chart behind me is. And what we're gonna do is go through the different departments and functions, tell you how they exist today and how the charter addresses them. So the first would be with the county administrator's office. Um, the county administrator's office is the chief operating officer of the county for the Board of County Commissioner agencies, not for the elected officials. Many of the duties performed by the county administrator will be assumed by the new county executive. Some duties will not. We will be recommending by September a, a structure, management, executive management structure, to capture all of the duties of the county administrator as well as the two deputy county administrators for the new government. Um, the Office of Human Resources. Today, the Office of Human Resources reports to the county administrator, and it oversees the hiring, discipline, payroll, administers our classification plan, policies and procedures for employees who report to the Board of County Commissioners. It's important to note that today, all independently elected officials in Cuyahoga County have the authority to do their own hiring, their own firing, their own promotion, set their own salary structures. A couple, such as the sheriff and the coroner, are looking at our classification factor coming into our classification plan. One of the things under the charter is there's going to be a three-person human resources commission. That commission will be appointed by the exec and ratified by the council. The Department of Human Resources will report up to the Human Resources Commission. One of the things that will happen is all the elected officials whose jobs will now be folded in as appointed officials, their staff will come under the Human Resources Commission and there will be a leveling out of salary, job classification, job duties, all of that. That will not be something we can snap our fingers and do overnight. It's going to take a long time to get that done, but that is one of the charges of the charter. The Office of Budget and Management today reports to the Board of County Commissioners and directly to the uh, County Administrator. It reviews all financial program management and budget issues for county agencies. When a county agency wants to bring a contract forward, one of the functions it goes through is a review by the Office of Budget and Management to make sure they have enough money in their budget to support the contract that they're pushing forward. If you've ever been to a commissioner's meeting, sometimes you'll hear a, an item is held NSF, non-sufficient funds. It's the duty of budget management to make sure we don't overspend and that when we do a contract, the money's there to do it. Under the charter, this department is abolished. The function is not abolished, but the Office of 
Office of Budget Management is abolished, the function can report either to the fiscal officer or it could report to the executive pending on a decision by the newly elected government. Office of Workforce Development. Um, in Cauga County, we have a workforce development board. We call it a WIB. It's jointly operated by the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County um, and involves city employees as well as county employees in the same structure. Uh, it's working to create a world-class um, hiring pool, if you will, for of employees for new companies coming into Northeast Ohio. Um, the jobs issues are mentioned under the economic, economic development part of the charter, but in no great detail, and this is something else that will be worked out as the new government comes in. Office of the Clerk of the Board. Current statutory duties include scheduling and noti noticing public meetings and maintaining the official record of proceedings of the Board of County Commissioners. Other duties perform aspects of procurement process, processing, review of all contracts and amendments, and changes in encumbrance amounts for commissioner meetings. This is really the individual who prepares the docket for each commissioner's meeting on Thursday morning. Under the charter, this office is abolished. There will be a clerk of the council. The clerk of the council will be hired by the council. Their compensation will be set by the council. Their duties will be set by the council. Some of the duties today performed by the clerk of the board will have to be sent elsewhere. They could end up in the procurement department or they could end up elsewhere, but those are duties that will stay with the executive branch. They will not go over to the council branch of the government and those duties will have to be reassigned. The next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is general government. Um, last year, as um, Matt talked about, we did an early retirement incentive program and one of my two deputy county administrators, Lee Trotter, decided to partake in that um, and he did retire. So I was, faced with a challenge is what to do. And I thought it would be unfair to replace that individual with a new government coming in, that the new government should be able to make that decision. I also thought it would be unfair to an individual to put him in a job that might have a very short lifespan. So I decided I really didn't need lunch, so I decided to take those directors on myself and they're now, they now report to me. Um, so I'm gonna do this part of it um, and we'll talk about central services first. Central services maintains county facilities and vehicles, manages real estate purchase and um, selling, all risk management functions for county staff, provides building, trades, and architectural services, operates animal shelter, mail room, parking, print shop, and archives. And up until about three or four months ago, protective services reported to central services, but we've since moved that to the sheriff's uh, responsibility. It should be noted, um, the county statutorily must have an animal shelter and we have to have an archives and a records commission. Other than that, the charter does not address central services in any way, shape or form. Um, however, central services will have to exist and will continue to exist and we will be making recommendations around that. We have a department of development, supports initiatives for quality communities, open and affordable housing, retention and expansion of employment opportunities, offers grant and uh, loans for these purposes to outside entities and local communities. Divisions include administrative services, community and economic development, housing, and the county airport. Under the charter, there's gonna be a new economic development um, commission. It will be created. It'll coordinate all agencies, boards, commissions, departments of the county that relate to economic development. It needs to coordinate with workforce development. Department of Procurement and Diversity is responsible for the procurement of equipment, materials, supplies, services, and construction for all county departments, and disposal of surplus property by traditional and internal auction. Procurement Diversity also is the arm of county government that oversees to make sure that we have diversity in our contracts and administers our small business enterprise um, uh, process. You may or may not know that Cuyahoga County, through a predicate study, is able to run a small business enterprise program. However, being an extension of state government, we are not able to run a minority business enterprise or a female business enterprise uh, program. However, with the charter bringing us under home rule, we believe there is a potential for the county, if it so chooses, to move into either an MBE or an FBE program in the future. So that's, but right now that is housed under procurement and diversity. Uh, the charter provides for a department of purchasing under the direction of the county executive. Justice Affairs coordinates public safety, emergency services and communications functions, provides support for community justice initiatives, 
includes witness victim services, coordination of reentry into our community, and second chance programs. Something most people don't know is if you call 911 from your home landline, you get a municipal answer. If you call from a cell phone, you get a county answer, which is then forwarded to the municipality. That we have CECOMs, Fusion, other things that they do. Justice Affairs is not mentioned in the new charter. Um, however, we'll talk about that when we talk about the sheriff and other things, but the functions of Justice Affairs must continue, but as a department, it is not mentioned in the charter. Move on to elected officials that are impacted by the charter. Just so you know, all elected officials as I reminded you, have their own personnel functions, their own budgetary functions, even though we oversee their budget, they do all these duties on their own. Again, that will all be folded under the executive and the new government. Um, they all be appointed. The elected officials that will be losing their elected offices, those, many of them will still exist. Those will be appointed by the executive and ratified by the council. Um, and all of the employees of these elected officials will be brought under the executive, the umbrella of the executive, um, as county employees subject to the Human Resources Commission. Coroner. The coroner is responsible for determining cause, mode, and manner of death when required by law and upon request. Office has both medical and legal duties. Under the charter, there is an appointed medical examiner. Charter sets qualifications, assumes all county coroner statutory duties, may assume other duties by ordinance as long as not inconsistent with statutory duties. So the, the medical examiner is mentioned, all those duties will come over with the ability to add some if needed. The engineer maintains and, and reconstruction of all bridges in the county, county roadway improvements, some road management and bridge and culvert inspection, managed survey and tax map records. Sanitary engineer does uh, wastewater, stormwater, and water supply management. The appointed under the charter, there'll be an appointed uh, public works director Charter sets qualifications, assumes statutory responsibilities of engineer and sanitary engineer. All the duties move over to the appointed official. The sheriff, responsible for safety and security of county courthouse, which is the Justice Center, Lakeside Courthouse, the old ju uh, juvenile justice building, but as you come in, there'll be the new juvenile justice building up on Quincy. Responsible for services there. We've moved protective services and security for all county properties to the sheriff's department. He operates the county jail. It does other law enforcement functions, ensure appearances in court, uh, directs investigations into major crimes and sex crimes, assists local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies with investigations, manages and enforces sex offender registry, operates the canine unit of the sheriff's department, also may in the future have responsibility for the county kennel since there are some law enforcement duties there. Um, carries out court orders, serves warrants, subpoenas, seizure of properties, sales of foreclosures, and delinquencies. Um, sheriff has pretty broad set of ranges. And again, many municipalities do a wonderful job policing their area, but there are times when um, a crime has occurred over multiple dis, um, districts or different areas, jurisdictions. A lot of times the sheriff will come in and take the lead in that investigation because the sheriff has county-wide authority where I see the mayor of Lakewood there or if a crime had committed in Lakewood and Richmond Heights, I see a councilwoman from Richmond Heights, they could do some investigation, but the sheriff has the ability to oversee the entire investigation because he can cross those jurisdictional boundaries. The treasurer collects real estate and special assessment taxes um, semi-annually, invests county funds, responsible for banking relationships that the county has with local banks, foreclosure prevention, unclaimed funds management, and claims. The charter um, calls for appointed, someone appointed to fulfill general law duties of the county treasurer and may assume other duties by ordinance as long as not inconsistent with statutory duties, charter sets qualifications. What that means in plain English is there will still be a county treasurer appointed by the executive ratified by the council that will do some of the statutory responsibilities aligned with the treasurer in the state of Ohio. There are some um, elected officials who will be eliminated or their functions will be consolidated by the charter. The first is the auditor. The auditor is the chief fiscal officer of the county, responsible for appraisals and assessment of property, calculating property taxes and administering, administering property taxes, determining taxing districts, share of taxes, sealing gas pumps, scales, other measuring devices, licensing dogs, vendors, issuing financial reports, managing the county's computer system. 
under the charter, all statutory duties are under the fiscal, now under the fiscal officer that were the county auditors. He also prepares and maintains tax maps, may assume other duties by ordinance as long as not inconsistent with statutory duties and charter set qualifications. It should be noted, the charter also provides for an independent county audit committee and a department of internal auditing. Uh, department director is recommended by the audit committee, appointed by council for a specified term, must be a CPA and at least five years experience in public financial management. And one of the things being addressed as we go through the summer is where would the internal audit auditor rest within the structure of the county and how do you do that? And it's something we'll be coming forward with the recommendation at the end of the summer. Clerk of Courts. Current responsibility is for filing and maintaining all, of all court documents and public records. Issues and records motor vehicle and watercraft um, titles. Under the charter, the duties of the Clerk of Courts are separated. Clerk of the Courts will remain, maintain court function duties. Fiscal officer will assume the title functions. County recorder. Maintains official records of deeds, mortgages, powers of attorney, and advanced directives, maps, plats, surveys, leases, and other instruments. All duties in the charter of the recorder will be under the chief fiscal officer of the county. Other elected officials who have not been addressed in the charter. Prosecutor, represents the state of Ohio on prosecuting crimes and provides legal representation of the county and elected officials in lawsuits and other matters, such as contracting. Charter maintains an independent elected position under the charter. Issue on the table is the charter also calls for the executive to have a law director. How will the duties of the law director and the county prosecutor coexist? What will the, be the duties of each and a decision to be made on those? The courts. Courts, interestingly enough, though, if you paid attention when Matt talked, I believe it's 45% of our general fund expenditure goes to pay for the courts. The courts were not included in the charter. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what the courts are, but what they do. But, you know, they prosecute crime, they do civil matters, do things like that. We actually have five courts in Cuyahoga County. We have a court of appeals. We have our general division of common police court. We have our juvenile court, domestic relations court, and probate court. I will point out to you that we are the only county in the state of Ohio that still pays a portion of their appellate court costs, and it costs us over a million dollars a year to do so. And we've asked Mike Foley and Senator Nita Turner to introduce some legislation in Columbus to fix that. We think we should be treated the same as the other 87 counties in the state of Ohio. Um, we want to go through, though, the size of the courts with you so you understand. The appellate court has 12 ju judges sitting on it. Common Pleas Court has 34 judges. Probate Division has two judges. Juvenile Court has six judges. Domestic Relations Court has five judges. And in conclusion, before I turn this over to Rick Werner, I hope I gave you a little bit of an idea about some of the complexity and vastness of what we do. Um, I don't know historically that we've been very good as a county of letting everyone in the county know the breadth and scope of what we do. We do do a lot of things. Um, there are a number of county entities that I didn't address today, mostly because I'd be up here through dinner. You'd be with me until probably 9 or 10 o'clock tonight. The Board of County Commissioners presently either sits on or appoints to 74 separate boards in the county. Um, in the future, we may sit down with you um, and bring you up to date on all of that and what those things are. But there are a lot of other ways that we impact the governance of this county. Those are boards and commissions that we appoint to. At the end of the day, I'll be back. I'll be glad to take questions, um, answer anything both up here on the podium, but in person, I'll hang around for a while. I do have a meeting at uh, 2 or 2.30 that I have to be back for. And now I'm going to turn uh, the podium over to Rick Werner, who's uh, my Deputy County Administrator for Health and Human Services. And Rick's going to give you a 50,000-foot um, view of health and human services in the county. Thank you. Thank you. And before, before Rick speaks, I'm supposed to give uh, a little bit about his bio in keeping with the... Uh, theme of uh, how we've presented these so far. I did want to make one announcement. I think I've seen a couple of candidates sitting in the gallery area, and I wanted you to know that I made the announcement at the very beginning that the table area is uh, specifically for candidates. So if you so choose, I, I understand you're probably taking notes and so forth. Feel free to come forth. Uh, there are some empty seats. Um, uh, briefly about Rick Warner, um, he serves, as you heard, as the Deputy County Administrator for Health and Human Services. 
a position that he was appointed to in December of 03. He's helped to coordinate the work of the county's human service departments that include the uh, uh, Cuyahoga Support Enforcement Agency, the Department of Children and Family Services, and the Department of Employment and Family Services. Uh, prior to his appointment, um, he had um, some time with the City of Cleveland, Executive Assistant for External Affairs for uh, the White Administration. I think that's when I first met him. Um, and uh, he received a Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University and a law degree from the University of Michigan, uh, now a resident of the city of Cleveland, and uh, we're thankful for his time today. Take it away, Rick. Thank you very much, Randy. Uh, first of all, I have to apologize to Randy. I, we were doing a presentation a couple of months ago, and as he got up to start the program, I whispered, break a leg, and I didn't mean it quite so, uh, uh, so literally, so um, I apologize in advance. Um, I, first, I wanted to just start out with the, um, some of the charter language about the um, health and human service function of the county. As you heard from Matt and Jim, um, health and human services occupies not only a major part of the, of the county budget, but frankly, an enormous amount of the state mandates um, on the county. And I think, as Matt mentioned, we're essentially a creature um, of the state when it comes to uh, health and human services. So many, much of what we talk about for the next couple minutes will be mandated programs um, that we are required to operate on behalf of the state and the federal government. They give us some resources uh, to provide those services, but as, as Matt mentioned, we also have to provide um, a very generous local match in order to make sure that those services are provided. I would say one other thing, though, about the term mandate when I use it. There are mandates that are, are imposed on us by governments above us, but there are also mandates that we as a community have gathered together um, to work on, and the commissioners have asked us in the Human Services Department to work on things that are equally as important as the mandates that are put on us by the federal and state government. We consider the local mandates, whether that's early childhood or reentry or homeless services, to be just as important um, and frankly worthy of budget investment as those mandates that are um, put upon us by the state and feds. Um, I'm going to take you very quickly through a number of slides, and I apologize for the um, the length of the number of slides, I believe this, this presentation is up on the county website, so if you want to refer back to it later for more detail um, or ask me questions after the break, I'll be happy to answer them. This is the structure uh, of the County Human Services Department. You'll see that um, under the commissioners and under the county administrator, there is the, essentially the Office of Health and Human Services that I'm in. Um, I have two titles, but only one job. Um, I'm the Deputy County Administrator for Health and Human Services. The state considers the office that I'm in to be the coordinating office um, for the uh, County Job and Family Services Department. Uh, for those of you who were around in the early 1990s, you may recall that the commissioners at that point went down to the state and asked for the ability to create a Deputy County Administrator position so that they could raise the level of the folks running all those systems um, on the left-hand side of the, of the slide, th those in light green. Those were departments, major departments within the community um, that up until the early 1990s were essentially run by a deputy director of the Human Services Department. The commissioners felt that it was very important to have accountable, um, serve at the pleasure, uh, unclassified directors in each of those uh, major service delivery systems. And so the state law was changed to create a deputy county administrator and then give this, the commissioners the power uh, to put uh, unclassified directors in each of the agencies um, in the green with the exception of the Family and Children First Council. Um, it is, this is organized left and right because those um, organizations on the left side of the screen are ones where there is a state or federal mandate that requires us to have that particular function. So Children and Family Services provides child welfare, uh, protective services, the support enforcement agency oversees the child support enforcement world within Cuyahoga County. Employment and Family Services provides um, public assistance services to a great number of families and individuals. Um, in the county. Senior and adult services uh, provides those same level of um, public assistance programs to seniors and it also operates um, very effectively and very importantly the adult protective service uh, function of the county. And I just might say just, just for the purpose of both uh, state, uh, county budget and the state budget, adult protective services is a good example of a mandate on the county to provide a service to protect vulnerable seniors and adults. Uh, for which we get about um, $250,000 from the state, if, if memory serves me right, and it costs us about $3.5 million to provide that function. So the additional revenue um, to uh, provide that service is funded by Cuyahoga County taxpayers through the Health and Human Service Levy. Finally, on the bottom, we have the Family and Children First Council, which is, again, a, a required agency for us to have from the state level. It is the policy and planning 
uh, body that involves lots of organizations within the community. On the right-hand side are those, uh, we've turned it up here, specialized programs, but these are the local mandates that the commissioners in the community have asked us to work on within res with respect to um, human service needs in the county. So system of care serves children, uh, deep end children, and provides prevention services to um, kids and families who are caught up in either the child welfare or the juvenile justice system. The Office of Early Childhood operates uh, the, the county's nationally known Invest in Children Early Childhood Program. Health policy, we are working very closely with not only the uh, federal qualified health centers in Cleveland, but also the, the three major hospital systems in Cuyahoga County to put together a system of primary care uh, that will obviously be drastically affected by the health reform legislation that recently passed in Washington. We have an Office of Homeless Services that oversees the transition from um, emergency shelter all the way through transitional housing and permanent housing. Um, we are, along with the city of Cleveland, the funders of the two, what they call base um, shelters, the women's shelter on Payne Avenue, which I might say is undergoing a complete renovation at this moment, um, and 2100 Lakeside, which is the men's emergency shelter. We also have worked very hard on fatherhood initiatives, on the fatherhood initiative, which attempts to uh, redress um, uh, the ignoring in the, in the past in many of our systems um, of the important role that fathers play in children's lives. Going over to the next slide, you will see the remaining functions inside the Office of Health and Human Services. Um, and I would say beyond helping to help those directors on the previous slide uh, get their jobs done along with their staffs, the Office of Health and Human Services um, is the uh, function within the county that tries to coordinate the work not only of the county agencies but also our outside partners. So the Adams Board um, that provides behavioral health services, Metro Health Hospital, the Board of Developmental Disability, uh, the Juvenile Court with which we work very closely um, as well as, as other um, public and, and nonprofit systems. So this just gives you a, I hope, um, a little bit of uh, uh, an idea of the scope um, of the human services operation at the county. The next couple of slides, I won't go into detail because you, you will have the opportunity to meet the directors um, and some of their senior staff um, after the, the overall presentations are done. This gives you some idea of the, uh, both the budget size as well as the staff size of these organizations. I would say in every case of all these organizations on these two pages, you will see that we have, while significant size staff, they are down considerably from a couple of years ago. I think Matt talked about the Early Retirement Incentive Program. I believe DCFS back in 2007, 2008 had well over 1,200 employees. Employment and Family Services had well over 1,100. So you see that we are attempting to deal with um, very significant service demands with many less staff than, than we used to have. And so it has required departments and directors and their staffs to work very hard on the kind of efficiencies that Matt talked about. I would just make one correction that I, uh, in, in a mistake I made on this, that the under employment and family services, there are 275,000 residents who receive health care benefits uh, through the county. And by my rough calculation, that's over 20% uh, of the county population who are on some form of Medicaid. If you could read this slide, um, it, it, it would tell you the story of the two health and human service levies that, that Matt uh, referred to. The health and human service levies, as he said, provide the infrastructural funding uh, for the county human services work. At the, top of the state, at the top of the page is the sources, the two levies um, that together combine uh, to generate almost $240 million a year of, of uh, funding. And then in the lower part of the column, and this is historical going back a few years, um, you would see the amount allocated to not only each county system, but also some of the major uh, independent organizations that have an affiliation with the county, like the Metro Health Board um, and the Behavioral Health Board, that get resources from the human service levy. I would just make a couple of points about the levy. One is that they've been in, the two levies have been in existence for well over uh, 50 years. They started out as two separate levies, one for health and one for welfare. Eventually, the state law allowed us to uh, create what I guess you would call omnibus levies, where we can use, where the commissioners and the new county government in the future can use those resources um, for whatever they deem to be health and social services. Um, we have passed those levies without losing one for well over 30 years. Mary Louise Madigan will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we lost one in 1978 in a primary election, which we then turned around and passed in the fall. Um, and, I, and I say that to say that despite all of the changes that are coming to the county and some of the clouds that currently hang over the county, those levies have enjoyed incredible community success east to west, north to south, 
within the county, evidenced most recently, as Matt mentioned, by the um, passage in May of the Health and Human Service Levy. In fact, from the human services perspective, perhaps the most important transition work that the community could do, and this were the taxpayers, not anybody at the county, could do for the new government was to pass that levy in May. So you will, as you come into office uh, in January, not be faced with an 80 to $90 million hole in the health and human service budget. In fact, you will be able to make decisions with at least that base funding in place. The next page just shows another uh, way of illustrating the, the uses of the health and human service levy dollars. I will um, just quickly relate to you the fact that we are in the process of doing the transition planning process. John Magala from the Center for Community Solutions and I are coordinating the process. This is the charge that we've been given by the Transition Executive Committee and we have set ourselves up um, in, a, in a number of groups to try to achieve uh, priorities or recommendations uh, to get to the Transition Executive Committee by the end of August as, as we're required to. I, I would end my, end my remarks um, just on a, on a couple of thoughts from those of us at the, uh, in the Health and Human Service uh, Department of the County. One, to just remind the, uh, you all, and I, and I know, I'm, I'm, I hope, I'm, I believe I'm preaching to the choir, about the importance of the levies. They are, again, the single most important part of what we can do locally to ensure that we continue to have a healthy health and human services safety net in the community. So you, as you take office in 2011, will be faced with uh, uh, prospect of putting together a campaign in 2012. There is a great infrastructure within the community uh, to pass those levies, but it requires the leadership um, of the current county commissioners. As many of you may know, Commissioner Hagan has for years almost single-handedly raised all the money necessary to pass those levies. That will be the job of the new county executive and the county council. Um, and I would just remind you that that, while it's probably not in the written job description uh, that Jim McCafferty spoke about in the charter, is a very important piece of the role of the county council and the county executive. The second, I would just echo what Matt said about the importance of the state budget. We are facing tremendous challenges with the uh, amount of funding that we get from the state going forward. Much of the downsizing that you've seen um, in county government has, been, at least on the human services side, has been a direct result of the state um, making decisions to reduce the amount of funding um, that comes to us. That looks like you know th that will occur in the next biennial budget. Uh, the process for which we'll start, I guess, officially in January after the new, uh, go or after the governor's uh, um, inaugurated as well as the new um, General Assembly takes over. And again, I think that the, one of the first to-dos on the, on the new county government's um, to-do list will be addressing um, and partnering with the other local uh, folks who go down to advocate in Columbus for um, resources for Cuyahoga County, not only on the human service side, but across the entire county. And finally, the other thing that I would just reiterate is um, I think Matt's collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I think lots of what we've been able to do at the county, and I don't say that just uh, with respect to county staff and county departments, but with our partners in the nonprofit community as well as the other public systems, the reason why we've been able to keep the social safety net in place, even as the federal and state governments have disinvested in us, and even as caseloads have increased, is because we've learned to collaborate. We hope to continue to learn that. We know we have much to learn uh, from the incoming government about how to do that, but I would ask you when you come into office to continue to challenge us to make sure that we are doing our best uh, to collaborate on behalf of the community. Thank you very much. Sir, thanks, Rick. So we have uh, five minutes to do the next uh, three uh, transition update presentations. Uh, we're going to move as quickly as we can. Uh, up first is Gary Holland, who's Director of Justice Affairs for the county. Um, that is a pretty broad uh, set of responsibilities, ranging from emergency management to uh, custody mediation, transitional community reentry for adults. Um, he uh, previously served as the di Director of the Franklin County Emergency Management Agency. He's also spent time with the City of Cleveland as Assistant Safety Director and Executive Director of the Community, Re community Relations Board. Uh, he's a graduate of Morgan State University and holds a master's in public administration from the Ohio State University. Uh, welcome, Gary Holland. Thank you, everyone. And once again, let me echo my colleagues, uh, Jim McCafferty and Joe Nani, who serve with me as members of the Transition Advisory Group that under 1307 is a mandated function of the Charter. Uh, we have had great success, I think, in working with uh, large numbers of people in the community. 
Uh, it, you'll know this from uh, the chart behind you, uh, how we have begun our work uh, process that the, that the map that we have used involves more than a thousand volunteers, many people uh, such as yourselves, and I've seen uh, as I've kind of hopscotched around the work groups and the subcommittees and listened to the accumulation of knowledge that uh, will be presented to you, to those 12 people that are elected to office and the recommendations thereof, that you'll find that there has been a serious commitment uh, to doing this right not just doing it, but doing it right. And so the 1,000 volunteers, and they ebb and flow, uh, but those, we are ex especially grateful uh, because we know that we could not have done this in a vacuum. We could not have done this simply by uh, sitting in a room, drafting something, and then submitting it to the government. We wanted to make sure that this was transparent, broad-based, and uh, it runs deep as well as wide. And there are other folks in the legal profession who have given t their time, other people in the business community that have given their time to provide subject matter expertise. Uh, so again, these aren't going to be just pie in the sky Pollyanna recommendations that you receive. They will be well thought out of, well researched, best practice, evidence based practices uh, that will have the rationale that I think you'll be able to embrace and understand. Uh, the operating groups that we have, uh, and I'll show you this in the next chart, uh, but we have uh, had a, a significant structure put in place that uh, we've been able to sustain. And as you can tell that we have at least uh, the partnership, that collaboration that Rick just spoke of uh, in this process where we have uh, county employees and public sector employees working very closely with our private and nonprofit sector. Uh, it gives us the kind of enrichment uh, in terms of discussion and output that I think uh, you would have come to expect. And we will also be working very closely with an executive committee that will receive uh, a number of recommendations from the work groups as they come up near the end of, of uh, August. And they will review those, work again and perfect those, and then pass them on to us as your legally constituted a transition advisory group. And then, as you can see, under the uh, executive committee, uh, in this last point there, uh, there are eight members uh, that, again, uh, are leaders in this community in both the private, public, uh, and nonprofit sectors. Uh, and we welcome uh, their participation and their leadership. So you'll see these, there'll be key recommendations for this new leadership. Those thousand volunteers are registered. That's not to say that people who show up at work groups uh, and in these subcommittees, maybe because of a certain interest, who may come back or may not. Uh, but we know that we can document a thousand plus of those volunteers. Uh, and you can see that we have uh, the transition advisory group, as I indicated, uh, the seven uh, members, the eight members, rather, of the executive committee. There are 10 functional working groups. And uh, we, we created those because, as Jim outlined, there are mandated areas uh, that are currently in place things that we're currently doing that we wanted to capture and make sure it didn't fall between the cracks. But in those discussions, we felt there was a need for two affiliated groups, public engagement, which is co-chaired by uh, our esteemed colleague here, uh, Randy McShepard, uh, and also the government collaboration. And on top of that, uh, the, there are two uh, ancillary groups, the Code of Ethics and dealing with campaign finance reform. All of those that are topical that uh, you will be uh, compelled to address in some form or the other, either adopting a countywide code of ethics or mandating that this new government have some type of ethical standard. Uh, and then, of course, campaign financial reform, uh, which the prosecutor is pursuing, will also be presented. Uh, the latest information I have, even though this shows 263 as of yesterday, uh, we had additional meetings. Now we're up to 270 of these work group, subcommittee, uh, public uh, education forums uh, that have been presented. That is extraordinary. Uh, when we thought there would only be 100 or maybe 150 of those, Again, the commitment of the people working in these uh, organizations and these processes uh, is that they want to come back and get it right. 
so that, again, what you have will be uh, the kind of uh, uh, recommendation that is substantial and, and, and important to the citizens of this community. Uh, the organizational work chart that you see here uh, is just an embodiment of what I explained to you. Those, those groups, boards and commissions, the county uh, council planning, economic development, the finance and administration group, human capital quality places that will be dealing with the economic development component on a smaller level, neighborhood level, a community level that the larger economic development work group uh, isn't addressing so that there is that kind of integration. Uh, human resources, human services, information technology, justice services and procurement and public works are the sampling of the work groups that we have outlined. Let me just give you, in a very short period of time, and, and, and I highlighted these in red, uh, important uh, benchmarks. Uh, the, as you can see, we uh, had this meeting today. It was important for us as members of the Transition Advisory Group and also the Executive Committee to provide this body of information for you. Uh, then uh, August the 3rd, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 31st, uh, there will be a significant turnover of information uh, to the executive committee. Uh, then comes the primary, and those of you who are fortunate enough to come through that crucible uh, then will be able to ex uh, really wrap your hands around those recommendations uh, so that by September the 30th, the executive committee will complete this review uh, maybe get clarification, amplification uh, from the work groups if necessary, and then, uh, as I said earlier, perfect those and approve those. And then we, uh, the three members that are part of the charter, uh, will receive those and also prepare them for a seamless transition uh, to the new government. And then, of course, you have uh, the general election uh, in November, and then we will uh, then present those recommendations uh, to the 12 newly elected officials. And we will provide, as Jim referenced earlier, uh, the kind of in-service government uh, primers you know, for those newly elected officials. And then finally, in January, uh, the uh, executive and county council will be sworn in. Uh, we will, we're responsible to getting us up to that point to bringing the ship into dock, as it were, uh, the tall ships that were here this weekend, in fact. Uh, and then finally, uh, we will uh, then prepare those recommendations uh, and hope that the new county government will look at what is on the short horizon uh, that needs to be done as soon as you take office, what can be done in 30, 60, 90, 180 days, and then there are what we call parking lot issues that are longer term will require more intense research by the 12 of you who are successful in your campaigns. Finally, I would just reference what others have, uh, that there is an abundance of information on the county's uh, website, the charter, cuyogacounty.us. Uh, you can go there and receive video uh, transcriptions. You can get the summaries of the work groups. Uh, you can get composition of the uh, work groups that I explained. And also, to keep up to date with our kids, we Twitter and tweet, uh, and also on Facebook. So I would uh, command your attention to those uh, sources as well. Uh, that concludes my part of the presentation, and uh, my colleague, I believe, is next. Thank you, Gary. Next, we have Joe Nani, who is, uh, prior to being assigned to the Transition Advisory Group, he served as the Cuyahoga County Director of Human Resources since 2005, uh, many capacities there. Uh, prior to that, he was Senior Administrative Officer for the County Administrator and the Loan Executive to the Cleveland Cuyahoga Convention Facilities Authority. Um, I can tell you he's working very hard with the transition process. He's also a graduate of uh, The Ohio State University with a Bachelor of Science in Social Work. So take it away, Joe. Thank you, Randy. Um, my topic area for today is around the Transition Advi Advisory Group's work between now and January 1st and the important day one needs that we have. Um, and again, as stated earlier, that we are planning follow-up session after the primary to focus more specific areas of the actual work of the transition process. We'll then be holding sessions after November, uh, the general election, where we will work directly with all the successful candidates on orientation activities and specific transition recommendations. At this point, the TAG is focusing on structural op options of the executive government, a, ch a checklist of turnkey needs for day one, 
planning the preparation and finalization of the briefing book for the newly elected officials, planning, uh, planning for support needs that arise during the November through January transition period, and finalizing space and facility recommendations for the new executive and council. Just a few details that I want to share uh, about some of those activities. As it relates to the um, overall county executive management structure, we're looking at identifying no more than three county executive management structures with a rationale for each based on best practices elsewhere, as well as consideration of offices and functions as described in the new county charter as well as existing required functions not identified by the charter. Of particular focus will be alternative senior management models um, operating um, financial, I'm sorry, uh, management models for operation, financial and county executive clusters, and different ways of managing some cross-cutting issues that relate to mul multiple departments and agencies. There's going to be a lot more collaboration between um, is, is before separate entities because of the ele uh, separately elected offices. In terms of recommendations for best practices and ensuring separation of powers, we're looking at, uh, at ways to identify these best practice models for the separation of powers to ensure the smooth and efficient operation of government. I mentioned before the turn, first day turnkey needs. There's a lot of information and a lot of things that need to be done just for day one. Uh, we're identifying those areas that must be addressed before the new county government begins operation, including how the TAG can ensure just Simple things like uh, the ability for the county to do things like pay bills, uh, make payroll, be prepared for labor negotiations, respond to emergencies, purchase goods, handle existing contracts that carry over into 2011. There's many contracts and things like that that just naturally carry over, that go over that period of time. And uh, take other typical actions on and after January 1st, 2011. This includes steps that the county can take in advance to establish capacity to operate on the first. So there's a lot of things that we're taking a look at of things that we can do now to make life much easier for you on January 1st. It's been mentioned before, we're working on a briefing book. We'll be preparing a document with information and recommendations for the new executive and council. This document include recommendations submitted from the various work groups. We're gonna synthesize it uh, and also have quantification where possible of recommended cost savings and revenue enhancement measures and any identified implications as it relates to some of those recommendations. Obviously, there's a lot of recommendations coming forward, and we think it's necessary for you to have both the positive and sometimes some negative aspects of what those recommendations mean, but you, just so you have the best basis for, the, uh, for a decision to be made moving forward. Um, the period between the general election and January 1st is gonna be extremely critical. We're identifying a structure of orientation for the newly ele elected executive and council during this time period. This will include critical aspects of county government, some that will assist the newly elected officials understand current responsibilities and other newer functions uh, created by the charter. Uh, we've, uh, Cleveland State University Center for Leadership Development in the Levin College of Urban Affairs has been asked to propose an orientation session model for the newly elected officials to assist us with that for the executive and the council. We're also looking at an orientation to the new charter for, for county staff of all the various agencies. They need to understand how these uh, changes impact their world. Um, and also, it's important to note that we'd like to work with the, uh, there's obviously gonna be some newly elected executives own transition team that we wanna make sure we coordinate early on, you know, the day after the election to make sure they clearly understand what we've done so far. Um, again, as, uh, as we keep telling you, telling most people to listen, there's no magic switch that will be flipped on January 1st and everything's gonna be done. Um, we're looking at all the aspects of after January 1st, things that don't necessarily have to be done on January 1st, but need to be on your radar screen to make sure that uh, uh, you've got a, a plan moving forward. Um, that's it uh, for my presentation. I'll be around afterward. I can go into a lot more detail. Uh, again, I want to remind everybody that, and as, as was stated earlier, you're hearing it a lot, but um, we're having extra session, extra session after the primary and then after the general, but also the website and all the various meetings that are taking place are a great place to uh, receive information about this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Last, but certainly not least, before our break, we have uh, Sister Joan Gross, who is Special Projects Coordinator for Cuyahoga County Administrator James McCafferty. We like to uh, affectionately refer to her as the triple threat. 
She's a Ursula Nunn, a county employee and an attorney. So uh, <laughs> I think that says a lot. Um, she uh, graduated from Ursuline College and uh, is uh, also a graduate of the Cleveland Marshall College of uh, Law. So with that, sister. Thank you, and what a joy it is to be the last person to speak to you when we're running 10 minutes late and you've been sitting here for an hour and a half. Um, so thank you, thank you for being here. Um, I am speaking right now in my capacity as co-chair of the County Council uh, Planning Work Group because so many of you are council candidates. We thought we'd give you a little taste of what that work group is planning. Um, we are focusing our work in four major areas. Council rules and procedures, council's role in the contracting process, council staffing and structure, and a day one organizational meeting outline. As for the rules and procedures, we intend to offer the newly elected some very, very basic rules under which the council can operate. They will address such things as meetings, the election of officers, committees, the, ri the variety of council actions, for in instance, resolutions versus ordinances, et cetera. Um, I know that the council will have to expand upon these, but we hope to offer you a start, a starting document. The second thing is council's role in the contracting process. The charter gives the council specific authority to establish contracting procedures and procedures under which the executive can employ consultants and experts. The charter does not indicate the role of the council itself, if any, in the contracting process. Right now, the Board of County Commissioners acts on every contract for departments under its authority and for some offices for which it has budgetary oversight. The Board of County Commissioners acts on every purchase, virtually every purchase over $1,000 in the county, every travel request and virtually every external meeting attendance request, whether it involves money or not. The contracting, this agenda and contracting process is very labor intensive. My view is that the county counts, the current county commissioners act on many of those things in their executive rather than their legislative capacity. So the question is, what's the council's role, if any, in all of that process? Some could argue that the council should simply establish contracting rules with which the executive branch departments must comply. Once the funds are appropriated by the council through the budget process, purchasing and contracting is an executive function outside of the legislative branch. In our current climate, some council influence over contracts might be prudent. Also, the state currently has a controlling board and Summit County has a board of control consisting of both executive and legislative representatives who approve certain purchases and contracts, meaning that the practice in similar government forms is to allow some legislative branch oversight, and I use that in quotation marks, of purchasing and contracts within certain limits. So we're looking at that. Given the above, the parameters that were, you know, what parameters should we set? We are looking at recommending a board of control similar to what Summit County has. Uh, one of the other work groups might be coming out with a different kind of recommendations and you might have alternatives to choose from. Um, certain categories of purchases within limits may be done by the executive branch departments um, and we'll see how that works out. We are looking at county staffing, including the clerk of council. We intend to recommend a staffing structure consistent with the charter language, giving the council the authority to appoint a clerk of council and other assistance for the council as a whole as determined necessary. Right now, the BOCC has a clerk's office that performs executive and legislative functions as well as procurement, clerk, and other functions. The new clerk reporting solely to the council will only have legislative branch functions. This is going to be a very different structure for all of the departments. It's going to require a lot of adjustment uh, for some of the county agencies who, who are used to processing everything through the clerk of the board's office. We will also be looking at the number and kinds of positions that the council will need in order to operate. We're looking at an organizing meeting outline, a working agenda for the initial organizing meeting of the council, 
number of technical steps that have to be taken at that meeting. Um, at some point before January 1, 2011, we expect to turn that outline into a script. Those are the four major areas that we're looking at. Obviously, there are a host of other things over which the county has control. Um, because we could not take on everything, we focused on the big things. Um, if you allow me a little bit of a sermon here. <laughs> um, I hope that what we in the transition process will recommend and what you do once elected, elected will lead to a renewed sense of purpose and trust and community for Cuyahoga County. I confess that I have been rereading the Federalist Papers, particularly those addressing the separation of powers. There's a great deal of wisdom in those old documents, noting the tendencies of human nature towards ambition and towards amassing power. But I'd like to think that we have evolved as a species over these past 200 years. And so I have great expectations for this new government. I hope the executive and the council will work together, respectfully engaging the issues confronting us and responsibly exercising leadership for this community. I hope that you will acknowledge and applaud and credit the good that goes on in this county every day and the many people who contribute daily to the building up of our community, including many of those who work for the government. I hope that you model not only good government, but great government. And thank you for offering your services. Thank you, sister. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my clock says 10.39. When we say we're going to take a five-minute break, we do mean a five-minute break, especially since time is not our friend. We're running a little over schedule. So I would really ask you to come back. Um, we really would like you to be seated uh, and out of respect for our uh, out-of-town uh, guests that will be uh, on the next panel. Also, we want you to be mindful of the fact that the time that we're eating away is the time that is slotted for your questions and answers. So be mindful of that. So five minutes. I have 10.39. That means... Uh, 1040. So 1045, we will start promptly. Thank you. <laughs>